Stick with what what we have authorized. You'll be safe. Be safe. I wrote down a list of like songs with JW music notes because <laughs> um, there's like so many great references in those. Um, oh man. Yeah, I, I love that. I've been dying to see if anybody picked up on that. <laughs> yeah. I want to oh, know what your favorite, screaming. what yeah. your top three favorite songs on your albums are. Yeah. Probably my, the first one on my first album is uh, probably Lost in Space. That one kind of just captures the whole mentality of that first album, or just that whole feeling of being lost and isolated. All the little JW references in it. It's funny because um that first album because i was still a witness a lot of my stuff had to be so coded which is real challenging mm -hmm. because you can't just go out and say you know i'm questioning all this stuff that one's a little dear to me because it was just kind of my my whole mentality during that whole time was just feeling lost in space and being on earth with everybody but feeling a million miles away at the same time that came across that whole record comes across you can tell it's coded right especially if you know yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's like a whole other language that uh, only certain people are going to understand. Yeah. One of the goals too was figuring out that there's other people that were experiencing that you know because you feel so alone at the time i didn't know there's a whole xjw community and you know people that had gone through this people that had the same exact questions literally and you know because i was so sheltered from being in it for so many generations if i can add one ounce of hey you're not alone out in this world like then i consider that a success that's actually a question I had for you. I'd like to hear at least two more of your favorite songs on your stuff, but I wanted to know, like, what were your goals in going to recording and releasing music? If there was anything beyond personal therapy or catharsis, were you trying to connect with other people? I mean, it's one thing to record the music or to write the songs because you feel you need to do it, but also like making it, putting it out there, sharing it with the world, putting it on a public site kind of thing that's a statement in a way right so I'm, I'm curious like what were your goals in doing that at the beginning it, it was really just to see if i could pull it off like i was really interested in seeing okay i had watched this documentary with jim carrey right before and he kind of talked about how his father was like one of the funniest people that had ever lived but he decided to you know be a professional accountant or something and then failed at it wasn't happy with it and he said something to the effect of i rather fail at something that i wanted to do than fail at something that i didn't even want to do and i just thought wow that's that's such a true statement and i just thought i, I don't want to die with regrets going you know i could have left something back i could have expressed myself and at least left behind some kind of legacy of who i was what i was thinking at the time never knowing what's going to happen down the end the more i started connecting and being open about getting out of the religion being able to be more expressive and direct about what i was going through then i started seeing the whole activist side and being you know comfortable watching videos on youtube and, and seeing okay they were demonized. People that questioned things were demonized. They really were the victims and all this and realizing that and feeling guilty about that. Just going, okay, like if I can accomplish this for myself and say, hey, you at least put something that didn't exist together to, hey, this might be able to help other people. It, it just kind of transitioned that way. And I've met a lot of great people through it. That's great.
had a similar kind of thing where I wanted to make something that never existed. I wanted to tell my story and that's why I made documentary, but it was sort of like this activism drive that I feel like I needed to add something to a space that I saw didn't even, nothing like it existed. And I feel that way about your music. I feel like of all, I've been paying attention to music made by former Jehovah's Witnesses for a long time now. And I think your stuff is just completely on the nose, referencing their own dialogue, their own art, and also is, is like a beautiful listen. And it's not really attacking them. It's just like putting out those ideas in, in, a, in this new art form. It's cool. I really like it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, like I, I didn't want to bring like any more hate into the world, but like I just had so much anger. And like, it's funny, like it reminds you of like that episode of The Simpsons where like Tito Puente ends up writing a hate song towards Montgomery Burns, <laughs> you know, just like that's the way he's going to get back to them with an awesome song. <laughs> like that's just what it, it reminds me of. And I understand why some people are that angry and they're just going to, you know, do hate videos and, and express their anger. I, I totally get that. You know, I, I'm not going to judge them for that. But just the way I wanted to get back was like, you know, I rather I rather insult you <laughs> with an insult that's going to go right over your head than punch you in the face. And it's kind of that. It's like, hey, here's a mirror to exactly what you guys are. This is the result, you know, like here's a picture of people completely covered in blood because there's going to be a theocratic genocide. Like that's not my making. Mm -hmm. That's not my art. They're their ideas. That's your ideas and your artwork. Like, how are you going to come at me with your own stuff? So do you um do you find yourself drawn towards the idea of activism at all? Or is it more about do you want to try to change the larger world of witnesses and ex-witnesses on any level, or do you just need to deal with it for yourself? Um, I think part of my healing process has to go from one to the other, because I've pretty much gone through all the, you know, five steps of whatever, and, you know, I've just come to accept it, you know, and so... The only thing that keeps me drawing me back to the activism is me remembering my isolation and just going, well, there's just as many of those that were feeling what I felt that took their lives because yeah. we didn't hear this song. They didn't watch this podcast. They didn't meet this person. And the beautiful thing about the internet is once it's out there, it's just a click away. Like, and then you think about all the people that that got out and questioned things before there was an internet, how alone that must have felt, you know? So it's going from thinking about myself and then just thinking, well, what's the larger picture? Like to me now, that's, that's more important. Like, I feel like I, I'm over it. If I never talk about it again, it's fine. Um, it helps for people to understand who I am, you know? Mm -hmm. like, you know, having a girlfriend for the first time after leaving, and being raised in it you know one of them told me like there's so many times where you seem so normal and she, <laughs> and then it's just, you know you'll just say something or do something and i'm just she's just like baffled like you know it's like who like where what planet did you come from like what are you talking about and i just like oh okay like i'm just always going to be an alien on this planet you know i may be a wizard but it's still cool to hang out with hobbits yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like i like that i uh I remember when I um, first like year after I left, I had started dating um, my now wife, Esther. The first year I was her boyfriend, I got to go to family Christmas. Oh, wow. And I'm like, I've never been at a Christmas thing. Yeah. Ever, right. Like well, it's things like that where they look just, at you going like, well, where are yeah. You? And you're like, what do I do with my hands? Yeah. Where do I sit? Who is this old lady? Like what is happening <laughs> and I felt I felt like I was on a movie set. Yeah. It didn't feel real. It uh -oh. felt strange. And I, I remember leaving and, and we're driving home and Esther's like, you know, oh, they all really love you. And my grandma said she thought you were great. And, you know, it's nice. My Aunt Mary likes you and everything. And I was like, that was the most uncomfortable three hours of my life. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> everybody was just having a lovely time. I don't know what just happened. I feel like I just spent three hours on another planet with 
just watching people and going, okay, how do humans act? Yeah. You know? And it was exactly what it very feels. weird. Yeah. <laughs> you feel like an alien, like blend in with the humans. And yes. Like, yes. Just, like, they, go from, they go from you just being a completely like normal person to like, in an instant, just being like, where are you from? Like, <laughs> I'm still well, so know. uncomfortable with getting gifts or being at a gift opening thing or even buying gifts for someone. It's like the weirdest, strangest. Really? Thing. Yeah, I, like it doesn't, it's not a part of my life. Like there's no, there were gifts in my childhood and that's it. But it wasn't on a holiday and like having like a ceremony of opening boxes one after the next is so bizarre. I went to an exit, my buddy Ross, I made like the very first actually be coming out video with him or one of the first ones and he's in the trailer. Part of what's filmed there is Swedish Christmas because his family's from Minnesota and all the XJWs in the 90s moved to California and they invited him down to Christmas and I was hanging out. So they invited me honorary guest to go to Christmas and it was like my, I guess my second Christmas, maybe the first one I did with someone else's family ever. It was, they were really lovely people and it was cool to see like the next generation who have no association with religion. It's yeah. like, you can see the success of getting out of this religion and like being, being fully detached. A whole family exists that have never gone to that congreg any congregation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very, that, you know, it's very Scott, I got I, two things. Uh, one, we got to do Christmas sometime. That'd be cool. I, I, I decided that the way to unweird Christmas for me was to get really into it for like three years. Yeah. So for like, I went, I got like a tree and I put up lights and we did all the presents and the whole thing. And I was like, if I, if I am now worldly, I'm doing this. I don't care. I'm not even, I don't even believe in God anymore, but I'm doing this materialistic, stupid holiday and I'm going to have fun with it because I want a couple positive memories to attach to it. That way, when other people yeah. get all teary eyed and have positive memories, I have some too. So yeah. I did. And it was great. It really worked. Like we had several really fun Christmases with me, Esther and Sid and before he got all grown up and moved out and all that. And it was I actually kind of like Christmas now. Like, I can't say like I don't want to murder people when Christmas music starts playing, but at <laughs> least I learned to embrace it and incorporate it into myself a little bit. And so if, if you and I ever get together over Christmas, we're going to have presents and it's going to be stupid and we're going to have tinsel. <laughs> we should bring it back to the Viking style because I just went on a mushroom scavenging uh, workshop. Foraging. Like, foraging, Ooh, foraging. foraging. Okay. And so like edible mushrooms, like chanterelles and stuff. Uh -huh. And I was talking to the woman who wrote a book and was running the thing. And, I was, and she had like huge Amanita muscarias. And I was like, does this grow under uh, coniferous trees, like pine trees? She's like, it does, especially in Scandinavia and in Northern Russia. It's, it's the thing. And I was like, and is the theory or the, the, the idea that this comes, this is the origin of Christmas, the red and white polka dotted mushroom grows underneath the Christmas tree. And there we, yeah. we get red and white Santa Claus and we have the Christmas tree. Sure. She's like, that's 100% the origin of Christmas. It's, it's psychedelic <laughs> mushrooms and shamans brewing it for you so you can have a, tr a psychedelic trip. Oh, I see where you're going with this. I can get behind this Christmas. So I, I like that you're doing Christmas at your place. It sounds great. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect combo. <laughs> Next Christmas, baby. Next Christmas. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> but but going back to like the, the being, uh, uh, you know, a life on Mars um, kind of thing, you're still pretty new to being out are you still feeling that no not anymore um at first like i kind of just figured to like turn the whole like alien concept on its head so going from like i feel like an alien on this planet and i don't know any of these customs to just like well if i'm an alien on a planet and they want to celebrate blah 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 and do this and that like why not and so then I was just like, well, if I went on another planet and they're like, let's celebrate Cliff Bob, like I'd be down. So like, why not just be down with Christmas? And after that, like having kids too, and, and being able to, like, I have two older ones that remember the JW life and the two younger ones don't because they were so small when they got out. Wow. Like, so like the older ones are like, 
those that escape the matrix and the younger two are the ones born out of it and it's just interesting seeing how like so many ex-witnesses i've talked to that are worried of getting out just if there's any out there that are listening one of the things that i've seen them hold back is like i don't know how devastating it's going to be to the kids when in reality they are the easiest to adapt yeah. like when we explained everything to our kids one night like they were just like okay so like we can celebrate this and this yeah we don't have to do this and this anymore no okay like and like so many parents i've talked to they're like oh i just don't want to devastate my kids it's just like they adapt pretty well so like it's helped to have like new traditions with them seeing them get to experience it as children and all that stuff that like i do i it's just such a foreign life to me now like yeah i, I was I was kind of nervous to ask about it, honestly, because you've referenced that your wife is now ex-wife and that you've got the four kids and I didn't want to poke a sore spot. So I don't really know. Uh, is she still a witness or is she not? A no. Witness? So what's the deal there? after I, after I had had processed my stuff for about two months, I, I kind of told her like, hey, I need to talk to you and just basically told her like, you know, I was really freaked out about the birth um i started reading the books and it's not what you think it is and if you want to stay i understand that i can't anymore like i can't do this double life thing i can't do this fading out thing like and so she processed it and she agreed that you know it wasn't what it was and she had to process on her own and then we kind of try to hide it for a while she was kind of in and out like there'd be days where she's like, yeah, you're right. And there's days where like, she'd still feel guilty and she'd go to meetings and stuff. So she went a couple of times after I did. And then the last one I went to with her, like the elders had cornered her about marijuana. And I was just like, you know what? I can't go to, I can't go to these anymore. I'm like, I'm out. And so eventually she, she agreed with everything I, I had showed her. And then we kind of just lived quietly for a while until, you know, everybody found out. But she um, she really didn't find me. And that was one of the things I was so worried to talk to her about is I knew a lot of times it would split and one spouse would end up out. The other spouse would end up getting even deeper into it. And then you know, the kids involved. And I, w- I had seen it just explode in so many people's faces. That was really delicate and very, very like fed it to her in little bits i just ask her questions sometimes like i'd ask her you know you know the mormons believe in this and she's like that's crazy and then i'd be like well you believe this and she'd just be like hmm just like okay so when i finally told her she kind of was able to digest it and she agreed that it was all you know a cult Hmm. so we kind of agreed like we got married like right when we met as teenagers like we were like one of those where like you're pioneers and you need to get on the job and have kids and become servants and all that kind of stuff so yeah once we kind of you know agreed that this was this was crazy and we needed to get out of it we don't really know anything like you know we don't know who we are we don't know why we're together like so it was like we can just you know we kind of just agree to like stay friends and 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 you know share the kids and and try to like break all these cycles of trauma that we've inherited from our, you know, all the other generations we came from in this thing. And, you know, it's had its ups and downs, but for the most part, like, yeah, we, we've remained friends and, and we share the kids and it's the best case scenario that I could have possibly imagined, to be honest. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, that, that's a, that's a tough path to walk. And it sounds like you were fortunately able to navigated that that's that's fantastic my first wife and i she left the witnesses and i was the one who stayed in and got extra deep we yeah. were we had a kid together and uh so i've been on that side of it and then the second one i left and she left the same day because she that didn't go well that's in the movie um and uh and then i didn't wind up in a healthy relationship at all uh until i met somebody who was never a witness and has no connection yeah. to witnesses so i i think that it's a good idea well i mean and i know other folks who have had similar experiences um where they're not together anymore but it's healthy 
Yeah. It's not like they hate each other. It's not like yeah. they split up. Like they, it turns out that in one case, you know, they were together because they were raising kids and they were witnesses and they got married super young, but one of them turned out to be gay. So they probably shouldn't have been together, yeah. uh, you know, know, and these I've things happen and it's nice yeah. to have a mature um, partner in that situation. So I'm happy for you on that. Thank you. Yeah, it really was that. And I was just happy to be able to say, Hey, can we just not do what everybody else does? That's great. So. I mean, and the kids, the kids seem cool with, with uh, the new uh, uh, religious situation. So, you know, I mean, at oh, least yeah. you didn't good luck. Good job on failing to indoctrinate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't have to feel guilty about that anymore. Cause man, explaining, uh, explaining why God shows you in 1914 to an eight year old just isn't as fun as you think it is. <laughs> I, 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 uh, when, when I realized I wasn't going to be a witness anymore and I went to my nine-year-old son and I'm like, Sid named for Sid Barrett from Pink Floyd, which I assume you'll appreciate. Nice. Um, I'm like, Sid, uh, dad's not going to be a witness anymore. And he's like, I was wondering when you were going to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, that sounds so right. I was like, wait, you didn't believe any of this? He's like, nope. Yeah. Nope. Never fell for it. Sorry, dad. You sucked as a witness, apparently, at indoctrinating me. He didn't say that, but that was pretty much the message. It was like, I failed a childhood indoctrination, and I could not be happier. Yep. I agree. <laughs> it's cool, dude. He's got as much hair as I do at this point. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, Scott, you got more questions? Yeah, I got more questions. Um you had a you gave us one top song lost in space what else what else hits for you on my second album the opening song dark days are here i have a lot in that personally i guess it's just one of my favorites When I was growing up, all of our conventions were in Dodger Stadium. And having a convention at a baseball stadium in the middle of the desert with no cover <laughs> and being in suits, like, it is traumatizing. It is traumatizing as a kid. And so uh, that song just about how odd, like, a convention is to a child, you know? Like, seeing, like, Bible characters running around third base <laughs> no, it's such a weird visual to grow up seeing and like no one's gonna get that no one understands you know seeing moses round third he's going for home <laughs> oh wait that just makes me really happy to picture that in my head <laughs> so <clears throat> that, that song's kind of about that experience and i end the song with an actual recording of my grandfather giving a um um convention talk oh wow so if you listen that's your to grandfather it, yeah if you listen to it there's an echo of a man talking that's my grandfather giving a oh uh, wow and talk Before they really talked. made these albums personal yeah that's yeah cool. i really tried to so that one's got you know a lot of emotional value in it and um i like apocalyptic homesick blues on that album too just because i kind of really unfilteredly explored like how terrifying the idea of jehovah's genocide is i remember watching like the end of game of thrones and seeing like the city tortured and it being exactly what Tyrion brought to happen and him realizing like i really fucked up and just thinking like putting all this time and effort and my reward is to watch you know billions of people die like that just started terrifying that i was able to believe that and process that so in that song like i really try to express like like that that experience of like doubt and also terror of what if it was right like you know there's those two sides of that coin that there's times to me where i was just terrified of like what if it's never going to happen like what if it's all bullshit and then there's times where i was terrified like what if it's going to happen tomorrow like and going back and forth and back and forth on that emotional teeter-totter um 
I just really liked that one. And I looked at like right after my cousin had left the band. So like it kind of just hits hard, hits home. <laughs> And then the light gets brighter, obviously, just because of all the references I get in there about, you know, the history. That's really about like just waking up to an Armageddon dream, which, you know, if you've ever had them are terrifying. In an Armageddon dream, all the worldly people scream, by a ring from up the love, proving that is I've had them lots of times. I was going to ask you if you've had the Armageddon dreams. Yeah. Like, it seems to be a pretty universal witness thing. Yeah. It's such a specific terror that only certain people will ever understand. So, uh, you know, I start that song off with that in an Armageddon dream and just kind of go over how, like, this crazy guy in the 1800s thought Jesus chose him. And this is why, you know, there's all this abuse going on. This is why there's all this death going on, and the only thing you ever get from them as an answer is, well, the light got brighter. A, I feel that heavily. B, it sounds like you almost feel relief that it's not true yeah i i would tell you the the second i finished that book and realized it was all bullshit i have never slept so well in my life i remember putting my head down on the pillow and just knocking out going i'll never have to see that in front of me i used to have panic attacks when i would get close to a you know a co-worker or something because my god i'm gonna have to watch this person burn in front of me and bury their bones and see birds pick them and just like oh my god like that's oh. off charlie boy you jumped the gun and all the prophecies you gave let us all but to the grave from again faithless slave but the excuse that they all gave was I wrote down some of the, the lyrics from both of those songs. You just mentioned like it's brighter and apocalyptic homesick blues. Oh. So in light gets brighter, I wrote down the faithless slave as a twist on words from the faithful slave. Yeah. Which is what the leadership of the religion call themselves. Hey there, all you broken ones come and drink life's water free, which it, originally it's not broken, right? It's like, Hey, there, all you thirsty uh, ones. Thirsty, thirsty ones. ones. Yeah. yeah. So I really love, I love that in that song. Oh. In the dark side with the apocalyptic homesick blues we have in the last days there'll be a rotting away of one's flesh while one is standing upon one's feet and one's very eyes will rot away in their sockets and one's very tongue will rot away in one's mouth that recording is actually one of the governing body giving a talk and i think i like, sampled that same talk in like, a song and i think scott that's the zero talk that you also sampled in the movie in the movie oh really okay i think so I could be wrong, but it's a batshit talk. I mean, that's like... Yeah, and he, he literally just, with complete joy and delight, just reads this, like, description of, like, getting their eyeballs sucked out and flesh and tongues rotting in their... Just like... <laughs> how do you so just dark. sit there and you're fine with this? I'm just waiting for the end to come. I'm just waiting for the end. Rotting away of one's flesh while one is standing upon one's feet. Today. And one's very eyes will rot away in their socket. And one's very tongue will rot away in one's mouth.
There will be a rotting away of one's flesh while one is standing upon one's feet, and one's very eyes will rot away in their sockets, and one's very tongue will rot away in one's mouth. You haven't mentioned my favorite song from the record, so I'm just going to throw it. I love Jehovah Never Knows. Oh, I, 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 I absolutely like that one was a standout track for me. That's the one where there's some like trumpet solo thing going on or something. Yeah. There's definitely a horn thing happening there. And it gets really lipsy and really freaky. And I just really like that one. I just dug that one. It's a solid I knew, song. Yeah, I knew a, a, a brother that had, uh, he like ran a trumpet company or something and he used to play it and I got a little recording of him. So <laughs> I wanted to end the song on like this weird jazzy note. So I took him, his recording, chopped him up, rearranged it, added all these weird things to it. <laughs> and it just, I was going to ask her, are you secretly a trumpet player too? <laughs> no. But now I get it. Now I get yeah. it. I, like I it. messed around with this, this this brother's recording and it just came out so eerie with the way it ended up, you know, being cut together that I was just like, yeah, that's a that's a nice feeling. Yeah, I, I think the first time I listened to those first two records, again, this is before you had Bloodless, but the first time I listened to them, I remember putting your stuff on and getting busy doing stuff. And it was during Jehovah Never Knows where suddenly I kind of like go, huh? That's cool. <laughs> The fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I like how you end that one with um, the governing body quote. It's a governing body member saying, stick with what we have authorized. You'll be safe. Yeah. Like it's so creepy and so frustrating that like people listen to that and that they feel like they have to say that. Yeah. Just, it's, just, uh, it's just struck me like how odd, how like blatantly open they can be now about the propaganda and the programming or they can literally tell someone don't ever read or look at this. We'll make that decision for you. Well, and, you know, like, <laughs> yes. according to Pew Research, they lose 65% of each generation. Yeah, that makes so sense. They got to be pretty severe about trying to keep the people they got, right? Like, we read something uh, this week that they have started to authorize young elders. They started putting people in the position of elder or young as men. Well, if they never get yeah. talks in anything and all they got to do is just like judge people for fucking they're gonna be fine <laughs> what else do you need to do no but seriously that's insane what you're not an elder if you're young i thought that was the thing we used to give the mormons a hard time about i know i used to hear that too how it's young is out. young what are we talking about here we used to hear you know trash talked about tv evangelists and now they're just internet evangelists they're tv yeah. evangelists they're yeah. like TV quasi no anymore. celebrities but yeah. I didn't know who any of the governing body was growing up. I no, never heard either. their names. I never saw their oh. faces. I had no idea. It was just like a, a, a group of spiritual men who were doing what is right. That's yeah. what, like the concept. Now, so, I'm old enough to have remembered that. Franz being a little bit of a celebrity. Really? Yeah, I, think, the, I the actually president always was. The yeah, president I, always was. I saw, so the when I was a kid, like like five, 
we went to a uh, and I'm dating myself here, but we went to an international convention in Milwaukee that was at the uh, big baseball stadium. And and one of the governing body, I want to say it was Franz, um, Fred Franz, not Ray Franz. Um, he gave a talk, and I even re- I still remember that. I remember how big of a deal that was. I remember my, yeah. my parents telling me that guy's going to heaven. He works on writing the Watchtower. He's why we're here. Um, so, you know, but today it's like, I could name like 10 of them just from yeah. YouTube. Uh-huh. It's bizarre. It's so weird. I don't know that there's 10 of them. I'm just saying I'd recognize rubber face dude and the other guy. <laughs> like, I know their pictures. I don't know their names, but I'm like, Oh, that's a guy he's on JW broadcasting. Yep. <laughs> and, and back when Russell pub- published the Watchtower originally, I remember one of the first issue of the Watchtower said, you'll notice we don't have any advertising in here. If we ever feel the need to ask you for money, that means we don't have God's blessing. Yeah. And now, now, now they, they beg for money all the time. MasterCard. I think they accept Bitcoin. Like they're asking you for your estate when you die. They want that shit written in the will. Like oh. they're not even hiding it. They're just like begging for money from every possible source. That's what happens yeah. when you covered up decades of child sexual abuse yep they're bleeding <laughs> yeah they're bleeding. i There's... never knew a witness uh congregation or family that did not have a sexual abuse story in it when i was growing up and now i realize how fucked up that was yeah me too Same. yeah i had a number of women and teenagers come to me when i was still a teenager telling me about their issue like their issues they're like i think i can trust you i want to tell you something really serious and they dropped that on me it's like, I don't know what to do. I have no training. I don't know who to go to with that. Like, I'm, I'm keeping it confident. She just asked me to keep it confident. Yeah. Um, to the point that one girl um, who was a pioneer, family's like deep in, dad's like a circuit overseer. Um, she, she told me that she, when she got married, she had um, started having these like episodes right after sex where she would act like a, she wouldn't remember it. She'd go blank and her husband would tell her what she did for like an hour and she would act like a six year old and talk about her friend coming over to play with dolls and like really like kids stuff. And, her, and then she had a therapist and the therapist was like, something happened to you when you were this age and we need to like harmonize, like bring both those parts of your brain, like something like sealed off that part of your mind and locked it away. And there was like two different versions like this of her. Yeah. And then she started having dreams during sex or like flashes of like her dad messing around with her and her brother messing around with her and like incestual stuff. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Stick with what, with what we have we lost. Have lost, lost. You'll be safe. Be safe. Be safe. I don't think I know anybody inside or out the community that hasn't been affected by that. Like that was one of the big issues I had um, as I was coming out of it after I had done the research on the 1914, 1914 thing and realizing it was all, you know, bullshit. The second thing was the sex abuse. And I was just so shocked and appalled. But on top of it, I remember confronting my family because my family still wanted to take my kids to the meetings. So thankfully, I, I, found out about that pretty early on so when they wanted to continue taking them it was a no from the get-go so but yeah my experience i don't know anybody that hasn't been affected by that it's so rampant you don't want to take your you don't want your kids to ever be in the vicinity of a pedophile like no no kid should be subjected to that kind of threat and And that place harbors them like fortunately when (laughs) One of the last congregations we were in, there was an elder that just really, really liked our family. And he would like tell me without telling me, like, keep your kids away from so-and-so, keep your kids away and -and so-and-so, wink, wink. Like, I remember there's a guy that used to like jerk off in the bathrooms during the meeting all the time. And the elders would just tell outside to make sure nobody like interrupted him. Just like, I was going to have masturbation (laughs) ushers. Like, I want that at the meeting. (laughs) (laughs) We had a... uh... We had a guy in our home. Oh hall. my God. We That's dark, but also hall. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> we had a guy in our hall who was um, convicted, went to prison for pedophilia, got served his prison term, 
came out of prison, got reinstated, came back in the hall. Yeah. And this happened while I was being shunned for blogging. <laughs> and I'm like, I never diddled a kid. I yeah. never did. I am not that guy. I didn't do prison time for child rape. And he's in and I'm out because I'm not convinced by your logic. Like, how does that in that universe? Like, I, I, I'm still mad about that. I think. Yeah, I had that conversation. Uh, I had that same exact conversation with my mother one time, and I flat out told her, "You'll have a pedophile in your house before you have me in your house." And I didn't do anything. And there's no response to that. She had no response whatsoever. Couldn't yeah. even deny it. Like, wow. couldn't even deny it. Well, you it can't. Is, it's it is the rules, right? Mm -hmm. He's a witness in good standing, and you're not. Yeah, he's been forgiven. There's this guy, very intelligent, like really nice guy, older guy in our hall growing up. And I I liked hanging out with him. We'd talk at the meetings, whatever. And then, but everyone had a weird thing about him. Like you, you could only hang out with him in groups. He wasn't allowed any responsibilities. And these should be like red flags, but you'd think, you'd think this, this guy went to prison for pedophilia we find out 30 years later after raising five kids in this congregation and there wasn't the only family with kids that he was a pedophile and everyone knew it except us our family the new family in the congregation wow. and and it came out to or like our family became aware of it like not even that long ago like eight years ago i was already out of the religion when i when i found out but I had worked for one of his victims. It was my, one of my first bosses. It was a, a husband and wife, small business. And she was one of many victims in their sex ring that he and his brothers were, were like hiding and keeping this thing going with little kids. That family has been doing this shit for generations. And wow. so many people are affected. It's like, how many people have I known who have either been molested or or like, have I been in contact who were actually pedophiles yeah. because of this religion? It's insane that this is, and, and my, my, I talked to my dad about this when I've confronted him after leaving, even in the last, like a few years ago, when I made the movie the week after I went and I like confronted my family and he's like, well, that pedophilia happens everywhere. It's not just the Jehovah's Witnesses. Like they're just like covering, that's their excuse. That's their blanket thing. Yep. Like you can't, you can't, that, that's not a sign of us being the wrong religion. There's pedophiles in every religion. Yeah, there's a, like you wow. see it with the Catholics. We're just as bad as the Catholics. That's not even a, that's not a bad mark. I thought we were supposed like, to actually be better <laughs> right? than the false right. ones. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's what they used to tell us. Uh, it's so, I mean, it, it's, it really does. No wonder you feel like such a terrible person when you first leave. Right. Yeah. You're like, I'm worse than these trash people. Yeah. And you know, you're not intellectually, but emotionally, uh, you feel like there must, I mean, it's like, could, uh, you know, 7 million witnesses actually be the ones who are wrong. And I'm the one who's right. Cause I, I don't think I'm a terrible person. I don't think I did anything awful, but they're, you know, my father's never going to speak to me again. My, my, my mother's never going to speak to me again. My, my, you know, best friend is never going to speak to me again. Like you have to question it when you're sitting there going, okay, well they can forgive somebody who has committed heinous crimes, but they can never ever forgive me. Yeah. I read an encyclopedia. Oh, no wonder people got to go to therapy. <laughs> I mean, I went to therapy. Therapy's great. I also started doing Buddhist meditation because I didn't want to kill myself. So, you know, I have a great uh, therapy thing to share. If you're down, I uh, went, I had a session today. Um, the analogy she shared to me with me was um, she's like, cause I, I have this thing and maybe everyone does on some level, put up, you know, put up armor. Like I, if I have an emotional experience or a traumatizing experience, like I put up this like emotional armor. I'm like, I'm not going to deal with that. Cause that hurts. And like she's like it's like you're shutting you're, you're stuffing something in the closet that's already full and you're shutting the doors and every time you open it like that shit comes back out yeah um 
and I guess that's the the extent of the the analogy, but it could apply to so many things in in life. So I'm going to work on opening the closet on some level and cleaning it. And she's like, you could. It's like imagine there's like some old clothes in there you don't want anymore, but there might be some cool shit in there. There's something in there that's like a value. Like everything from your past isn't garbage. There's some really solid, great things, great memories. You need to, you need to like open the doors and clean it up. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, oh, no, definitely. that's good advice, man. I mean, I remember getting another similar, well, different piece, but useful piece of advice when I was in therapy. I had a therapist who gave me the analogy of when you when you've got a trauma and you've got this difficult piece in your past, he compared it to do you guys remember when the the bridge collapsed in Minnesota, the 35W bridge? It's like right there. Yeah, like a bunch of people died. It's like a yeah, it was this seven story bridge. steel bridge or something. Yeah, it just like collapsed and fell in the river and a bunch of cars fell in. It was a huge yeah. trauma. And he was saying, imagine you were driving across this bridge and you were on the bridge and you had just gotten to the to the end and it collapsed behind you and your car was sitting there on the edge and you were you were not sure if you're going to survive and then you did survive but then every day all you thought about was that trauma you just kept thinking about that you could have died you could have died this could happen he's like you will literally if you don't do something about it you'll spend the rest of your life on the bridge yeah it won't matter that you're actually not physically there anymore because mentally you'll still be there you got to stop revisiting the bridge you got to put that in your past and until you do that you're on the bridge like no matter how much time has gone by and i think about that with witness people a lot especially in the activist and the xjw community i've seen people who have been out for 20 30 years and they're still trolling the, the news groups and they're still in the reddit groups and they're still on the youtube channels and they're still relitigating the thing and like you guys are still on the bridge and I've seen that with my own, I have some family members who are ex-witnesses who went way before I did, and they're still hung up on stuff from the 70s. Yeah. And yeah. and that's where I feel like the therapy thing becomes super valuable because yeah. it teaches you the skill of like, put the, like, open the closet, take uh -huh. everything out, accept what's good, you know, decide not to dwell on the parts you're not going to keep, and then get off the damn bridge and move on with your life. Don't need to shit you don't want to charity. Yeah. Yeah. Throw it away. <laughs> all your all your garbage winds up in somebody's goodwill pile. That's <laughs> that's healthy. <laughs> the analogy breaks down right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Was, okay. But it's still just it's an analogy. Burn it, you know burn it up. <laughs> Make art. Make art with it. Yeah. On the way Make out. Art to connect to other people who had similar experiences and then have cool conversations with them for a couple hours that other people will now listen to and will be inspired as well. <laughs> Amen. Perfect. Every formula. <laughs> Everybody who's listening, do that. Also, go buy his records because the Bloody Tuesdays are really good. Bloody Tuesdays on Bandcamp. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one of the songs I, I wanted to bring up was I Am That I Am for some of the lyrics he used, I wrote down was, how can you be truly free born into such misery? Good rhyme. <laughs> In a false reality, will the truth set us free from the mental slavery? Would you try to change me cerebrally rearranging? We are all just suffering in a false reality and Armageddon false alarms. Like that song is filled with little gems of a reflection of this religion. I wanted it to be the last song on that album. So lyrically, I just wanted to sum up everything, the whole experience as best as I could. And those are like the analogies that kept coming back was just having someone else inside your brain. And how do you deal with that? How do you get them out? Religion is Religion.
uh, I don't know if you guys ever seen the movie like Jojo Circus. It's about this this kid in the Hitler Youth, and the whole movie he interacts with the Hitler in his mind, but then you you end up realizing like it's the programming. Jojo, Jojo Rabbit. Rabbit. Yeah, yeah, Jojo yeah. Rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's you know, really like, good. I really like, enjoyed that. Yeah, like, it's a great movie. That analogy, like, just it just reminded me of how like you just have this Jehovah in your head, mm -hmm. you have this Hitler in your head the whole time. Like, how do you get rid of him? I never thought of that while watching that movie or that from my programming, but that's what's happening. There's like this other voice that when the programming turns on, yeah, like this cult dialogue starts going. Or my I, friend would say, I never thought about it rolling. that way before either, but you're right. It's another person living in there. They've built another creature inside your mind. Like, you, know, yeah. like, you know, and like he's so he's so happy to have Hitler in there at the beginning, but then in the end he realizes like that's not even me. Like that's someone else in my head. Like that's a lot to to process. And it's like, you know, like your analogy about cleaning out the closet. Like a lot of people get lost in the different phases of cleaning out that closet. It's important yeah. to get to the end of it, or else you do end up stuck on that bridge. I actually had another question about your music, if you don't mind. Sure. Do you feel like you've kind of gotten it out of your system with the three albums? And if so, do you have, do you know kind of what's going to inspire you to your next album? Or oh, yeah. Yeah. Break, um, or have you already written 80 more songs? Because you're so fucking prolific. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually, to be honest, have about two records worth more of material that I, I haven't touched yet. So um, wow. I feel like as as far as getting out like my view on the whole experience and the cult, I would say yes, I feel like I'm done with that. But early on, I realized, as you guys understand as musicians, like when you hear certain songs literally from birth <laughs> every week for 20, 30 years, like you have no like choice but for that to filter into your subconscious so like well i don't think like i'm writing directly anymore about the experience like i just feel like here and there like there's still those notes and those melodies that creep in every now and then without me realizing it but as far as the next ones go um working more on like a uh one album that's more on the psychedelic late 60s early 70s vibe and then another one that's more of a for lack of a better word, I guess, prog rock, more of like a at the drive-in, radio head kind of stuff. I'm trying to yeah. think outside the box. Very excited about your next albums. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I thought this third one lyrically had had very few ties to the religion compared to the first two. Yeah. And yeah. it felt like a like you had grown not only like in your skills, you had like transcended the experience in a way by putting out all that other stuff. Yeah, Ryan was talking about earlier, you know, My Bloody Valentine's been a, a huge um, influence, kind of had from the get-go an idea of just doing like an album that didn't really have any religious connection and just, you know, putting out just a bunch of songs that were about every other topic I didn't get to write about that wasn't, you know, religion. Cause I didn't want it to like, become like such a big part of my music to the point where like that becomes a label like so this one I feel is like really independent of that mentality of religion and just kind of going for musical landscapes and ex experimentation and doing that kind of concept album I guess for lack of a better word I'm a big believer in writing from wherever you are and so a topical record can be excellent right it can be yeah it can be the perfect thing you need at the moment. Nope. On the other hand, when people's entire output is topical, it does tend to grate, at least for me. If somebody's, a, I don't know, like a gospel singer and every song they ever do is reminding me just how damn great Jesus is. Yeah. Like, this is your 17th record on the same 
topic and reality has many more things in it, right? You yeah. could write a song about chocolate cake and it would be more interesting than another song about Jesus. So <laughs> I liked that you did a very topical, very direct record and then you followed it up with something where you explored other stuff sonically in different directions. I really do appreciate that about the three you've done so far. And, and I know that as an indie artist, you probably don't get a lot of actual direct feedback about your music. So I wanted to make sure you got some here because I think you deserve it. It's good shit. Yeah, I definitely appreciate it. But yeah, but I, I like how you, you got that, that batch together and then kind of thematically connected them and musically connected them. And then you did another record that goes a different direction. And I like them all. So I'm not saying that I, one is better than the other, but I think I kind of like the fact that the Bloodless album didn't, I, I could have listened to that and had no idea that you had any witness connection and that would have been totally cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely feel the same way. I definitely feel the same way. It's definitely not gets all hung up on the lyrics. I'm just like, Hey, <laughs> I like this music. <laughs> There's three tracks on there that we wrote down as being super solid, miserable man that I am the sinister and the strange is Jehovah never knows on that one. Or is no, that Jehovah never knows was true. Okay, I think the rest are from the previous ones that we wrote on. You know, Miserable Man That I Am and The Sinister and The Stranger, super solid. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah Miserable Man That I Am is a hell of a song. That was that, really that's cool. probably one of my favorites, to be honest, just in general. Yeah, just yeah. Like, really, really, like, lights out, man. <laughs> that was my bloody valentine just so you know so like, oh, i'm wow. a big fan so <laughs> jealous right now <laughs> <laughs> they played at the uh, palace theater in st paul it was the last show i was at before covid so oh, was, wow. uh, not cool. counting not counting uh uh one live performance i personally did after covid i haven't been to other shows so i'm like i'm i'm jealous of that i still haven't seen them yet so Oh my God, man, dude, there's this thing that they did where they played like just one giant wall of sound that was almost physically painful for like eight minutes. Yeah. And I felt like my whole body was vibrating and I was levitating off the floor and I was smiling so wide. I thought my head was going to explode. And I was like, I am not even on drugs right now. And this is the best <laughs> feeling ever. Yeah. And I just, I, I can't even begin to describe how happy every second of that my bloody valentine show made me i don't know how many years it took off my life or my hearing but it was worth it so it's, good it's so hard to capture the sound of shoegaze like you know for recording because like it's a whole other experience live oh yeah you know yeah. to feel those vibrations from head to toe like in a dark room with like low lights and the build up, the way they just take their time to build up the wall of sound. And once that wall takes over, you're just gone. Like drugs, with no drugs. Like it's I just, mean, I know it's something to be experienced. It's, it's like seeing like, like Animal Collective or any other kind of band that just gets you out of yeah. your headspace and puts you into this thing. Their landscapes, their musical landscapes are just so amazing. And the patience that's required. Yep. to allow for the build up of the sound and yeah. like the admirable restraint of not not jumping in when you want to do the thing i remember watching like belinda butcher just stand there for like a whole song just like not even touching her instrument yeah <laughs> yeah and it was perfect i love it there's so much to learn in in all of that well, this is some... a great fucking record it's all i'm saying thank you we wrote down a few bands that we thought influence you it's a short list we didn't go too hard on that but ryan wrote down pink floyd oh, and, yeah. and flaming lips oh yeah i love flaming lips and the flaming lips for me are really important. I bought the tr transmissions from a satellite heart, their first record. 
when I was like 17 and it became, I, I used to snowboard like a maniac. Like that's all <laughs> I cared about for a few years. And I would wax my snowboard before every session the night before. And I'd put that record on for the process. Oh, and to this really? day, to this day, I have not waxed a snowboard without transmissions from a satellite heart. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic, man. I that's love that. Awesome tradition. <laughs> and, uh, there's a few songs on i can't remember which albums i think the second maybe but like there's some vibes in there that i'm like oh man the drum sound is so satellite transition from satellite or um there's a guitar sound in, in one of your songs i'm like this or the vibe was just like i don't know if that does that resonate at all oh, yeah yeah definitely yeah. I, I love their sound i i love how futuristic they sound yeah like when i think I, about like what what would future music sound like like <laughs> i like the thing of the flame <laughs> This, the future still has not caught up with the flaming lips. In my that's opinion. true. That, that's a good point. Uh, I worked with a guy in Denver who um, lived, grew up down like across the street from the singer. So oh, they were buddies. They used what? to get drinks together. Yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> uh, so Scott, you missed this, but you know that Awkward Bodies, which is uh, David, that's the band I currently play in. We're a local indie rock band in Twin Cities. There's a few records. We're working on a new one. One of our last shows before COVID was a Flaming Lips cover set. What? At the wow. uh, Bryant Lake Bowl in Minneapolis. And we were literally playing on a stage in a bowling alley. And we did a whole set of Flaming Lips, including Pilot Can at the Queer of God. So we had a good time, man. I wish you would have been able to be there for that, Scott. That sounds awesome. <laughs> that was a kick ass set it was fantastic and uh it's the only time we have ever ded dedicated an entire set to oh, wow. covers and it was it was the lips because it had to be so. <laughs> <laughs> the rentals you know the rentals i love the rentals Rent rentals for I me are amazing it's like the basis from weezer's side Weezer. project or like yeah side. yeah he you, started you, as a side project and then he left Weezer and, and went full time with it. But yeah, I love there's such a hidden gem. There's what is your favorite I left religion record that's oh. not from a Jehovah's Witness? Ooh. Do you have any? There is a record that I fell in love with. I don't know if she left religion. I got to talk to her a little bit after a show and on Instagram. And all she kind of said was it was about transitions. Okay. In her life, going from one thing to another. And her the artist's name is charlie hilton and she has an album out about transitions that just blew me away it was so beautiful from start to finish and i always tip my hat to artists that can create a whole album because <laughs> no one wants to listen to them anymore so yeah well you know, if you can if you can entertain me for 30 minutes of sonic bliss please do so uh, yeah i will check that out i will check that out that's why i'm asking the question i want selfishly i want to know but that kind of broadens it, right? I think that's good. Good to look at it. A record that you would listen to that you feel like resonates with the experience of transitioning out of religion. How about yeah? That? It just it just had that vibe, and like yeah. that's what that's what popped into, into my head. <laughs> I know that I and Chad Rieger and a couple of other people I know swear by "Curse Your Branches" by David Bazan from Page of the Lion. Oh, wow. um, oh I love Page of the Lion. If you are a Page of the Lion fan. You need uh -huh. to you owe it to yourself to spin a copy of uh, Bazan's Curse Your Branches. It is extremely resonant. It, I think of it every time I think of leaving uh, the religion. He didn't leave our particular religion, but it's similar to your second record, David. It, it resonates okay. on themes about going through that transition from point A to point B, and that's a record that I absolutely adore, and I can play it from beginning to end in my head okay, so check that out for sure you know what's what that makes me think of and i wrote it down in our notes for doomsday hieroglyphics your track because at the end of that track you have this charles taze russell going off about the pyramids oh in, yeah in a talk and it's it's comical and awesome i have never heard that actually um but it, it reminded me that there was this song by you know the band jawbreaker yeah love jawbreaker i absolutely love their last album they did in 96 called dear you I bought that okay. record actually here in LA when I was out here with my skateboard buddies from high school, we did a, a like a one month road trip and I fell in love with that record. And then I followed that, that guy, that singer, and he started Jets to Brazil. You yep. ever heard of him? Love Jets to Brazil. Me oh too. my God. I, think Jets to Brazil. I performed a cover of Sweet Avenue at like no my last Jehovah's Witness solo gig. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Tasting so, you in rain. I 
Whoa. Yeah, me too. I used to cover that song live. Yeah, oh my oh. god. That's, we should so do a cool. duet sometime. Holy yeah, I haven't heard oh. anybody mention Jets to Brazil in forever. <laughs> they're one of my favorite bands of all time, and they have this song. And they're they're like contemporaries of Pedro the Lion, because yeah. I, I don't know what that space was, but there was like a, a scene. Like that and, Kansas nine, late 90s, like indie scene, dude. Yeah. So many good uh, groups came out of that little Kansas yeah. scene. Yeah. Oh, was it Kansas? I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, like the Promise Ring. Promise Ring was huge, yeah. Yeah, like that kind of music. Texas is the reason. Like, mm. yeah, all those bands. They were just all like Midwestern, like indie bands that just like were amazing. Like, there's stuff. I mean, there's nothing like, to do in the Midwestern. American either. football. Like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> really. Yeah, I just heard about them recently. I didn't actually know them. One of the guys in New York City when we were at the film festival, he brought up American football as one of the bands he loves. I they're feel like, I knew like they're connected to the promise ring and cap and jazz and okay but this this there's one song from just brazil on on the album four cornered night and i looked it up because it just struck me the way you use that russell quote in your song he just is quoting some part of the bible i think but, i know what you're talking about yeah but he he yeah it's actually brought up the page but i'm, I'm actually going to read the lyrics is it, it's like a kind of a cool song because it's like one of the only bands i allowed myself to listen to that had anything to do with religion when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And it, it just straight up quotes Revelation. And yes. He, he sings, and the trumpets pounded in my ears, the sun shone black as sackcloth of hair, and the path was paved with treachery, joy, joy, for I was received. In thy knock I heard an open door, brought the lamb with seven horns, the beast and elders fell before the lamb, angels teemed then 10,000 strong. And the armies flew upon the earth, locusts rose with, scor with the scorpions, we were sealed according to our deeds. Joy, joy, if I was received. In the dark, I heard Omega call. For one to rise, one must fall. And the angels and the insects fed together, made a man of men. Together made a man of men. Amen. It's like an acapella. I don't even think there's instruments in that song. Yeah. Or maybe just guitar or something. But it's like, I loved that. And I, it reminded me from your track of that. And maybe Jets of Brazil. I don't think they're like a leaving album, but they were like a transitioning time for me. Yeah. Like, I listen to I shit remember, out of those records. I remember having that record on repeat and I fell asleep to it on repeat. And I remember waking up to that very song and just going like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I know exactly what song you're talking about. I love that. Cool. That actually it makes me wonder if you guys ever heard a record from a band and while listening to it, you thought they have to be ex witnesses. And then you wind up like on a Google Foo thing, like being right. like, okay, dig in, somebody tell me out. if they're really an ex witness because I can hear it. I can hear yeah. it. I know it. Yeah. Uh, or like they were the witnesses or they're on transitioning. Who? Yeah, the Menomina. I Menomina. love Menomina. They've got this album called Moms. It is one of my favorite records. It is so, so good. I swear to God, and I don't know why, but I swear to God, I can just tell one of them was a witness wow. and i don't know that for sure they might <laughs> not have been but it feels so like it and it resonates so much that it's been bugging me for years i like wow. i for like i listen to that record almost every day for like two years and i'm just like no it's there it's there sometimes it's, it's actually turned out to be true where i've been like they're a witness i can tell i can tell i can hear it and then, then they work there was a song by uh not pennywise no pennywise yeah where they this they, they have a song called society and they sing society as like the chorus and it's like such cult language to call to refer to something or like the religion as society yeah like maybe there's some thread there you know there's been a few songs like that where it's like a lyric or uh but does that attract you to it or repel you yeah. from it? Well, see, it attracts me because it's like if they're making music they must not be in it anymore and that's interesting and it was interesting to me while i was a witness and it's still interesting to me on the outside yeah, there's a song by Vampire Weekend called Yahe, which is like a twist on Yahweh. And it's all about like Babylon and America not loving you and you don't reveal your name. And I'm just like very witnessy. Like, I don't know if he was an ex J Dub or what, but if you ever check out that song, like it has a lot of Yahweh Jehovah references to it. Well, sometimes it's a little more obvious that for some reason that just triggered my memory of the fact that van morrison has a song called kingdom hall that one's not very subtle 
<laughs> Apparently his mom was a witness. So oh, wow. I didn't know that. That explains why he's such an angry man. I know. It's like that dude needs some therapy at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I got a I got a message the other day. I just want to share. So we did this podcast with nobody asked us to do this out in Connecticut. And this is Joe Mitchell and Ruben Ortiz. Ruben was in um the Crusaders, that documentary that just came out. I don't know if you've seen that. Have you guys seen that documentary? That no, came out? I didn't even know no. about this. Oh, it's <laughs> it's it's really cool. Um it's it's I mean, like, basically Okay, it basically has all the act like the big activists from the XJW community who are they're doing great work, and and it's like quite a quite a great pare down of the community. He listened to that podcast and he he reached out to me on Instagram and he wrote to me saying he loves that I've left these breadcrumbs for people to follow. He runs like a nightclub. He just like has a life outside and doesn't do activism or get in touch with the community, but he's wanted to show appreciation for like what we're trying to do. And with this film and and whatnot, but we got to talking and and one of the things he said was like how punk rock saves his life. And he wrote that punk is perfect for that because there's a sense of presence. It stands for something, but also stands for just being alive and acting like it. And the chat we were having was basically like the music and the culture of music and the culture of like DIY allowed for free thinking and freedom of expression in a culture where that's not even allowed at all. A culture where that's like crushed. It's and finding I, the complete like solar opposite of what you're in. Yeah. Like if yeah. punk rock were to rail against anything, it's oppression. And this culture is like deeply oppressive to yeah. your mind and, and your way of life and every form of expression. And that was just like a really cool way to like get to know someone and immediately like, oh, we agree on this. And I feel like that's that's like the maybe a through line that I think we have with this podcast and the film is like, and maybe what worked in the in the Witness Underground, the, the nuclear gopher, nuclear gopher uh, community, the music community in the film is, is like this other way to connect with people that's deeper and more profound and more emotionally strong than what this facade of this multi-level marketing company or whatever you want to call this, this cult was able to create in a community. Music has this way of drawing people together on a much deeper, more foundational level. And I think that a lot of the way I think was like framed and informed and, and created a path for me was, was through, through that culture of, of music. And even though it's a very individualistic, at least from the outside perspective, I found friends there. Hmm. Well, it's interesting in that I can look at you right now, David, and we've never personally met, right? But I heard your music and then now I've, talk to you for a little bit and i feel like i already knew you by listening to your music because what you were putting out through what you were creating was some of it was in code some of it was direct some of it was about the witnesses some of it wasn't that is what music can do right like it can let you say things that a social construct doesn't let you say and yeah. the witnesses bring such a powerful social construct where how you spend your time and the, the topics you're allowed to discuss and the opinions you're allowed to have and the person you're allowed to be yeah. are all prescribed. And then you meet somebody and you, you get artificial feelings of kinship and friendship and brotherhood because you're both of the same circuit assembly or whatever. And they hijack that family thing. Yeah. Music in art in general, like any form of creative expression is such a subversive thread that you can, if you can do it, even while you're in, it lets you call out to other people who are in, who are also feeling things and saying things. That was why our community ever started was because we made our stuff and put it out there and other people found it because they wanted to make their stuff and they, we were drawn to each other, right? And I think that that is continuing to be really valuable in the next witness life which kind of connects to the like have you ever heard a band and been like hey there's an ex-witness in this band i think there's something really important there i don't know totally what it is i'm really glad scott's been very in interested in making movies about it and exploring these stories for people because he really has done cool stuff on that and you'll enjoy looking into it I sometimes sit there and think, you know, like, did I waste my life staying a witness for all that time? Uh, did I, did I spend, I saw this cartoon the other day that was like, somebody dies and goes to heaven and they're standing next at the gates with St. Peter. And they say, I spent my entire life being in a band. Did I waste my life? 
or did I ruin my life? And St. Peter says, thousands of people heard your music. You ruined thousands of lives. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes I feel that way because like I've been putting my music out for, you know, forever and I've been doing all this stuff and I'm like, well, I never got rich and famous. I still have to work in software engineering, blah, blah, blah. But then I think like, well, shit, I've met some amazingly interesting people because yeah. the, I resonated with what they made or they resonated with what I made or we wound up in the same community together and we found each other somehow. There's just something about doing that artistic expression and getting it out there. Yeah. Separate from a capital motive or anything else that just allows you to communicate in a way other people can't communicate. It's just, I love it so much. It makes me so happy. That's well, that's why I do this podcast thing with Scott. I mean, I know Scott's going to eventually win an Oscar and be rich and famous, and I'm going to be in the gutter with a guitar <laughs> and a tin cup begging for scraps. I knew but... him when. <laughs> in the meantime, this I just love that you were making stuff, and uh, I'm glad you're out here making it. I, and I, I, I hope it helps you lead. It leads you to some more people in this community because there's a lot of cool people doing stuff in this community. And I'm glad you're sharing your stuff. That's all I got to say. I just wanted to end on the positive note of like, keep making art. It's really good. It's worth it. I'll put the Bandcamp link at the top on the YouTube, but you should buy, buy David's record. Buy you all three for 20 bucks. Yeah, but you can always pay a little more if you feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> Bandcamp lets you do that. Yeah, very cool. But yeah, Maybe, I agree. Uh, when's yeah. your next one coming out? You got it. Yeah. You got a release date? Um, I'm hoping it's, to all, it's it. already been since December since you released Blood. I know. I mean, yeah, you're late. You're late. Oh, you should have another album by now. I haven't done an album in like eight years, man. So you, there's no rush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now uh, the first one's just kind of in the uh, ready to get into the mixing process. So just touching up here and there adding taking away it's nice to like not have to feel so rushed and know a little bit more than i did before so well seriously sidebar me if you have any questions about things oh yeah definitely i i appreciate that so much because yeah. it was so frustrating talking to so many cool people and just getting well don't really want to let you know <laughs> i won't i won't sidetrack this me th this meeting oh my god i got corporate there for a second i won't side sidetrack the podcast for it here we've been a lot of fun and i frankly, yeah this I've has enjoyed been... the hell out of meeting you david so this has been great yeah same here same here i'm thrilled yeah, to have your have you highlight you and your music i think it's amazing and everyone should know about it and yeah. your story you've been through a hell of a lot respect that's all i can thank say you. thank you yeah i can't wait for this doc I, I did get the trailer and man <laughs> the music's good uh it made me tear up like it's just i cannot wait to see this thing well send you a link imme to... immediately after this perfect yeah perfect. Getting, i'm looking forward to knowing you for a while man yeah definitely same here all right everybody thanks for tuning in um by david's record bloody tuesdays on Bandcamp. and if you're interested in watching the film uh, we're doing a watch party uh, later in the month, last Thursday of February. So see you next time. Thank you.